Hey everyone, happy June. It is your real estate and mortgage market update. My name is Denise, the mortgage nerd, and we're gonna talk all things facts. Y'all know if you've been following me on social, I've been talking a lot about data over drama. We all know that the news outlets like to showcase the drama, but we're gonna talk about things about interest rates, recessions. We're gonna talk about how home prices them decreasing is not the same as home values decreasing. So stay, pay attention next five or six minutes. I promise this is going to be worth your time. So the first thing I want to do is show us a comparison of basically going back towards the 1945. We can see that the home price appreciation of real estate has been on a steady increase. And the only time that we saw a dip in real estate was of course, when the 2008 housing bubble took place. And then after that, we have seen steady increase. And so it's really important to note, to mention the two reasons, main reasons why the 2008 housing crash took place. Again, I know most of us know, but one is corrupt lending. And when I say corrupt lending, I mean, we didn't verify income. We didn't verify your job status. You could have just said that you work at XYZ and you make this much money and we would write mortgage loans. There wasn't as strict of guidelines with down payments and credit scores. The old saying, if you could fog a mirror, you would get a loan actually happened. And then the second thing is that lenders could hire their own appraisers to assess the value that they needed. So think about it. If I was helping a client and they were buying a home and let's say the price was 500,000 and in order for me to close on this loan, which is how I get paid, I needed that home to appraise for 500,000. If the appraiser came back and said it was worth 450, do you think I would continue to hire that appraiser for my clients? The answer is no, because I need it to appraise for value. So when the appraisal process was like that and the lendings could pick who the appraiser was, we saw an increase in cash out refinances as well. So people were taking equity out of their home. We weren't verifying if they could qualify for it. The mortgage payment went up and then they were living a lifestyle of buying jet skis and multiple properties and they were financing their lifestyle. And then of course, everything came crashing down. The biggest difference between our market today versus our market then is important to mention. We don't have those loose guidelines. We still have very strict income qualifications. If anybody's taken out a mortgage in the last 10 years, it's not an easy process. It's like you have to prove that you are innocent because you're treated like you're guilty. We prove your job. We prove your income. We have to use very conservative income calculations even. So if you make bonuses or commissions, or y'all know if you're self-employed, very, very strict calculations. Sometimes we can't even give you full credit for your total income that you get that gets brought in. So we don't have those corrupt lending. And one of the things that these pessimists, I'll call them, keep bringing up is, well, what about all these people that took the forbearance assistance because COVID hit, you know, all those people are going to start foreclosing and take a look at this. This is the monthly number of loans that are in active forbearance coming from May, 2020 to where we are from April of this year. You can see that there's been a slow decrease. People are exiting out of the forbearance and guess what? we still have massive inventory issues. All these people that said, all the people who are gonna skip these mortgage payments and file forbearance, that's when the housing crash is gonna happen because they're gonna default on their mortgage because they won't be able to afford it. Well, guess what? People today have more equity in their home than ever before. Do you think they're gonna walk away from that easily? It's not like it was in 2008 where the bank fraudulently gave you the value of that house no, these people have their own hard working earned cash into the home. So example in 2020, if you paid a hundred thousand dollars over list price, the bank didn't give you that hundred thousand dollars. The person took a hundred thousand dollars cash and paid for that. So now they have a hundred thousand dollars more invested in that home. They don't want to see it go away and neither does the government. So that's another big difference is it's not, financed property, the equity that we have today is with very strict appraisal formulas. The banks aren't corrupting that. There's a round robin system that we have to use and people are more invested in real estate with their own cash than ever before. 
So let's take a look at the lending standards. This is another chart, it goes back from 1999. What this is measuring is what's called the product risk versus the borrower risk. Product risk means the types of loan programs that were available. So stated income loans, um, we would call them limited doc loans where we didn't actually ask you to verify the assets that you had, um, bank statement loans. So you can see from 1999, there was a lot of creative loan programs that allowed people to get into a home without really fact checking if they could, you know, actually make that mortgage payment. Then the housing crash took place and look, you can see very little red and very high what's orange, which is called borrower risk. And so there's not those creative loans anymore. The borrower risk means that the banks are looking at, do they have a good enough credit score and credit history to that we can prove your ability to make that mortgage payment? We're using those income calculations. We're using very strict debt to income ratios. And so what you can see here is that in the last decade, the borrower risk is more than the product risk, which just says banks aren't writing these mortgages for people and then, you know, poof, all of a sudden they're not going to be able to pay for them anymore. Uh, so that's just something to specify. Now, the other thing is we have an affordability issue, 100% uh, homes, the inflation rate that's increasing. I mean, gosh, I just filled my tank up with gas and it's insane. That is definitely real. The cost of not just owning a home, but buying milk and getting gas has been more expensive than ever. That is real. If we look at though, the mortgage debt alone to someone's household income, I was talking to a realtor who's like, yeah, but in the nineties, you know, people could qualify for more and it's like, yeah, but they also didn't make as much money as they make now. Um, and so the mortgage debt to household income is lower today than we've seen since 1980. That's pretty incredible. So based on someone's household income to their mortgage payment, again, verifying that their income, their ability to make that mortgage payment is lower today than the 80s. So we don't think that there's going to be a massive fallout or massive default like we saw in 2008 when we had the housing crash. So everyone's million dollar question is, well, what's ahead? Here's what the predictions are. So I'm going to show you guys a couple different slides. This is showing you what home prices are expected to do over the next four to five years. And there is a slew of economists that get paid six figures to analyze data. And even if Q2 of this year, our GDP numbers down, which means our economy has gone into a recession, even with interest rates where they are today and forecasted to rise, even with inflation with where it is, people are still predicting, not just people, really smart economists people are still predicting that a house today is going to be cheaper than a house a year from now. In fact, about three, four, five percent cheaper and then two years from now. So what that means is that a home price today is still cheaper than where it might be two or three years from now. And here's the rumblings that I've been hearing the most is we have seen in the market more and more price reductions. And so there's this thing that's going out there that's like, oh yes, finally, the price of homes are going down. They, the value is going down. You have to be careful with the terminology because just last month in this area, if you just analyze the sales over the last 30 days, homes still sold for 6% on average over the list price. When we see those price reductions, that's because the real estate community and the appraisal community is trying to figure out now that there has been a slope of demand. The rising interest rates have taken a lot of people out of the market. So demand has gone down a little bit. We're trying to figure out sellers and realtors are trying to figure out now where to price the home in this new market. Last year, we saw appreciations in the 14, 15, 16%. If you go to market and you list your house at that same amount, you might be having to lower your sales price in a week or two because the appreciation rates are slowing down. That does not mean that home values are depreciating. Meaning if you bought a home last year at 450,000, that this year, because of all these price reductions, doesn't mean your house is worth now 400,000. It's not depreciating in value. It's just the market trying to figure out in this window of a shift, 
what the new appreciation rates are. We've been spoiled the last two years. So be mindful of that. It's not doomsday that we see these price reductions. All of a sudden it means that, you know, homes are depreciating in value. The good news is for the buyers that are out there, it does mean that if a house listed, let's say last year, they might have gone to the market at a 12% increase and now maybe they only go to a 6% increase. So it's a good thing for the buyers. It's a good thing for all of us. We want this market to be healthier. I want to buy more real estate. You guys want to buy more real estate. We want the market to be healthier. But this is the forecast. So you can see in 2022, we're still expecting a 9% increase. Then it slows down a bit. If we look at this next chart, I really love this one because in green, it shows you the optimist and blue. It gives you all the panelists and economists. And then in orange, it's like the ultimate pessimist. And they are still forecasting through 2026 again with inflation, with GDP, with gas, with the war, all of that stuff. They're still anticipating a 10.3% increase in real estate. So it's pretty phenomenal. Keep in mind when you buy a house, it's not a short term investment. It's not like you're buying a house today and hoping to sell it next year for a profit. Most people on average are staying in their homes between seven, eight and nine years. So a 10% increase in your home or a 46% increase or heck a 26% I think we'd all be thrilled to get. The key is none of these really smart economists are predicting a crash, a bubble, um, anything like that. I think it's important to, to show that. This is showing the Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, CoreLogic, just more economists. Again, their uh, opinion is lining up with what we just saw as well. So there were a lot of really smart real estate people um, interviewed for this, and all of them are saying that they are still predicting that home prices will continue to go up. Um, one of the things I did want to show you guys is... I've shown you guys this chart before. This is the historic mortgage rates over decades. 1970s, it was 8.86%. 80s was 12, 90s. In the 2010s, which was our last decade, when the gov government stepped in and they kept interest rates artificially low by buying a ton of mortgage bonds, every, I don't care who you voted for, each person printed money, they bought mortgage bonds, they wanted to help the housing market recover. And so mortgage rates were really, really low. The question becomes is what are we going to see in the decade this year and the decade up until 2030? We don't know. Rates today are anywhere between five and a quarter to 6% if your credit score is below a 700. So when people ask me, well, do you think interest rates are going to come down or I'm going to wait to buy until interest rates come back to the threes? I don't know if we'll ever see them in the threes or even the fours, because if we look at the data, we can see that this prior decade, they were kept artificially low to help us recover. And now we've got to get a healthier market. So I just don't know if if rates are going to go down. Maybe they'll come down a little bit in the recession. Will we see them in the threes? I just I just don't think so. So the last thing I want to talk about is affordability. And this is something that a lot of people are not talking about. I want to give us real data on but homes are so expensive because interest rates are so high and home prices are so high. Take a look at this. This goes back from 1990. This is the Home Affordability Index. The higher the bar, the more affordable uh, homes are. So if we take a look at this from 1990 until 2008, all these bars were below this dotted line. Then, like I just mentioned, when this last decade, when interest rates were insanely low and we had more distressed properties on the market than we'd ever seen. Distressed means foreclosure, short sales, basically homes selling at a discount. Of course, look at this. Homes were super affordable, but did we get spoiled? Do now today we think that homes are not affordable because we're only comparing it to this last decade? Well, let's take a look. Here's where we are today. So obviously this bar is the lowest we've seen in the last, you know, since 2000, well, really since 2008. So is that emotion of us feeling like homes are so unaffordable real? It's absolutely real. But if we look at homes affordability prior to the housing crash, we're actually still pretty ahead of where we were even then. So it's just interesting that when we look at data, yes, it is natural to feel from an emotional standpoint that oh, rates are so high and home, home prices are so high, but it's kind of like comparing you know, if you bought, 
you went to the store and bought an apple and let's say the grocery store was having a sale that was buy one get one free and so the total cost of the apple was a quarter you're going to be used to that apple costing you a quarter now when someone says oh no it's 75 cents you're like holy smokes that's expensive in reality if you look at over a larger piece of time when that apple wasn't on sale and you looked at it before those sale prices and it was at 70 cents you're like oh that's not so bad it's just five cents more it's just that we're comparing where we are today to when everything was on sale rates were on sale and homes were on sale so it's just something that i wanted to make really clear to people i know this video went way longer than expected the last thing that i'll show you guys is on average if you read this the average consumer is spending an additional 429 dollars a month for items other than like mortgage, rent, shelter, you name it. And that's because of inflation. So meanwhile, the average weekly wages rose $212 per month. So the consumer is short by $217 a month. This means that the average consumer will be looking for a home that is about $40,000 cheaper. So that might mean that the house that you buy today is not your dream house, but it's a roof over your head and if you're renting, it means that you're getting out of that rent race because we all know rent prices are going up just as fast. And if maybe you already have a house, it's for you to decide, do you want to sell your house and buy another? Are you downsizing? Do you have a two story house and you don't want those stairs anymore? And you're having to pay to the AC for the top and bottom, or do you have a house with a pool and you're in the phase of life where you don't want that darn pool anymore? If you sell today and you still buy today, it does still mean that you're getting the house cheaper than where you would be two or three years from now. And if interest rates go down, y'all have heard me say this before, if interest rates go down, we will help you lower your interest rate and keep your term with zero out of pocket. So if I'm wrong and rates go back down to 3%, you bought your house today at the price, we know that they're expected to go up. And in a couple of years, you can just refinance with myself and the nerds, pay zero out of pocket, Let's say you've been in the house for two years. We'll refinance it at a 28 year term. It's not doomsday data over drama. You have to stay really real and don't let these headlines freak you out. So if y'all need anything, you know how to find me. Sorry for the super long update. You know, normally I keep it around eight or nine minutes. Tag a friend, hit subscribe, share with whoever needs to hear it. Thanks for tuning in.